What I want to do is try to show my gratitude to the state of Oaxaca, the energy of Oaxaca, and how it helped develop my, my work as a fiber artist. What you've been looking at on the screen is a house that I lived in in 1959. We're going back that far. It's in Newmarket, England. I was on a secret project that I still don't want to talk about. <laughs> I made pretty good money. It was 1959, I was 26 years old, and the project was coming to a close. Uh, I was offered perhaps the chance to do the same thing in Turkey, or to take a first-class ticket back to LA, air, air flight. Neither one sounded very good. I was really, I was making good money, but there was a sort of an emptiness about what life was all about. And I thought, there's got to be more to life than what it is. I didn't think I'd find it in the United States at that time. Uh, I turned the $601 first class ticket into a $500 ticket on a freighter to Hong Kong. Uh, I thought that would be an interesting way to go home to LA. And it was. And in that trip, I discovered world craft. And I discovered the energy of the ethnic people of the world. And they were actually clothing that part of the world. And it's something I had never seen before. Briefly, this is in India, of course, a shibori, a tie-dye. I'd never seen things like that before. And I saw people doing it, and I saw people wearing it. Uh, I thought I wanted to stay in Hong Kong and become an English policeman. My accent was so good by then. But I thought I'd better get home. And I wandered up to Japan and I, I was introduced to indigo. I'd never seen indigo. Oh, before Indonesia, uh, uh, chop printing and uh, batik. I'd never seen that before. And in uh, Japan, in Kyoto, I wanted to stay there. But finally, I thought, I've got to get home. I entered UCLA for the third time, but this time as an art major. And I took a, a textile class, and the instructor gave me acid dyes in little Gerber bottles. And I did this. And I did this batik. The batik, my chop, was out of a linoleum print that I used a little cheese oven, a little sandwich oven, to heat the linoleum up, and I would print with it. At this particular point, I decided that I wanted to weave my own cloth. I didn't like the idea of using anybody else's cloth. This is four yards, by the way. And I'll be showing this on Saturday. Um, this is Verily Osborne. Uh, this is Verily Osborne as a TWA hostess in the 50s. I did not know her, but she also had the same emptiness in her life, even though she had this exciting life of flying around in airplanes. And she came back to school before me, and we met at UCLA. She was an advanced ceramic student. I was a beginning one, still trying to center clay. We met, we decided we want to become art teachers, and uh, we married in 1965. In 1967, in our Volkswagen, we drove to Mexico City because the Anthropological Museum in Mexico had just opened up. And we went, we went down to Mexico, and in the museum was this beautiful section on Oaxaca. We learned how to say the word. We didn't know what it was. And then we looked on a map. We had a map of Mexico, and three inches below Mexico City was Oaxaca on a very curvy line. One afternoon, we got in the Volkswagen, in the afternoon and drove thinking we would have dinner in Oaxaca. 
15 hours later, we got to Oaxaca, but along the way, I wanted to show you this picture. This is from Morelos, and this is a wonderful contribution of clay artists and fiber artists working together. And you who are in um, uh, wearable art, I want you to look at that beautiful profile. We entered, we entered Oaxaca in the northern part, and we came across these three triques. Two triques are on the left. The fiber artist on the right-hand side <laughs> decided to make a raincoat uh, and destroy a banana tree. <laughs> it, it worked beautifully, and that's, again, what I loved about the indigenous people being survivors and being able to think quickly about how to solve a problem. That's always the way I've taught my classes. It reminded me of a coat I saw in China six years before in the New Territories. That beautiful coat that you can see way up in the back there is very similar to what the woman did with the banana plant. I met a weaver, we met a weaver in Oaxaca, spinning silk. I didn't even know they had silk in Oaxaca. And here's, of course, another weaver spinning wool. And here's the first time I'd ever seen a backstrap loom with the tree case. This is a shot from the Gelaguetza before the government took it over and made it into a moneymaker. It was a very intimate affair, and you sat very, very close to the participants. These young ladies were about to dance the Flor de Pina with a pineapple. And if you were lucky enough, you would catch the pineapple at the end of the dance. If you were not so lucky, you might get a black eye or be carried out on a stretcher. But what I want you to point at, what I would point to you is the woman right in the middle with the very dark uh, outfit on from Usila. And that interested me because it looked like, here I was a beginning weaver, and I thought, how in the world did they do that? And in another shop, I looked at it, here's from Usila, and it looks as though they painted the cloth after the weaving. Now that's something I never thought about. And then two years later, Cordray put out a, his book, Mexican Costume, and indeed it shows a woman from Usila stretching her huipil and then painting certain areas on it. I went back to UCLA and started weaving my own cloth, silk, with fibers that I knew would resist the silk dye, the acid dye. So here's one of my weavings, boom, that's with wax on it, and I've painted in the orange, all from Usila. And here's the piece. Here's the close-up of the piece. My master show dealt with shibori. I was a photographer, that's actually what I did in England. And uh, so here we have close-ups of the shibori process and then the shibori pieces, but then I also had uh, these batik pieces that I had done based on what I'd seen in Oaxaca. And this is another piece from my master show, 1968. By the way, in 1968, UCLA, the art department was controlled by art historians and uh, they did not allow fiber. Fiber was not appropriate to be shown in the art gallery. Netta Alihilali and I got our master's. We weren't sure we were going to get our master's degree because it depended on the opinion of the art historians. Uh, but we had to show in places across campus rather than be accepted into the, um, the art gallery. In 1970, Virali and I packed up and moved to Oaxaca. We then had a two-year-old and a six-month-old, a German shepherd, and our parents thought we were absolutely out of our minds. Uh, we had accepted um, a business to teach teenage girls 
to introduce them to the cultures of the world. It's something that's hard to imagine nowadays in today's world. And if Vera Lee and I were to have the program, it wouldn't be teenage girls, it would be probably politicians and religious leaders who that we would invite them in to see another culture, to understand another culture. We bought Casa Panchita without even seeing it. It's in Xochimilco. This is Casa Panchita then. This is Panchita Perez, who still runs the place, Casa Panchita, in her kitchen. And here is a wonderful clay tribute that Vera Lee did, Panchita's apron that is in the yard at Casa Panchita. This is our summer group. You can see what happens. We had up to 19 girls each year. And the point was to introduce a culture the dance, the song, they could weave, they could do ceramics. We also had uh, built a dark room, and in those days they could develop their own black and white uh, film, and then they could go back to the village and give the village people photographs that they had taken when on their visit. It was really quite a wonderful experience. Here's one of the photographs from that particular time. This is Tilted on the Valle. A friend of ours, Don Chico, invited us down to Tehuantepec, said we should bring the girls for August 12th, the birthday of Maria, where the Tehuana women's strong feminists, as were our summer girls, uh, to a party. Men were not allowed. Women danced with women, the, the orchestra was women, and here's one of our summer girls dancing at that particular festival. But the Tawana said, well, when you come back next year, wear a costume. And so Don Chico made sure we got enough, and here's this wonderful picture of our summer girls going the next year as Tawanas to the Tawana Festival, August 15th. It was a fantastic program. And here's one of, the pro, one of the photographs that one of the summer girls took in Tlaquiaco. Uh, in terms of my own work, I was enthralled by the ubiquitous uh, reboso that almost everyone wore in the 70s. And I did a piece of that based on the reboso. I did a reboso. At this point, very time, the gentleman sitting at the end of the table, Jack Larson, wrote me a note. And he invited me to do an ECOT for an exhibit that he was planning in 1975 because he was coming out with his Dyer's Art book. And so I wrote, in those days you wrote letters back and forth. <laughs> I'll explain what that is later to some of you. And I wrote, and I sent a few sketches to Jack about what the piece might be. I don't know if any of you have ever received a note from Jack. It's either on a very large piece of paper or a very small piece of paper, but the lettering is always very, very big. And so the letter I got back from Jack said, Jim, no. <laughs> and then a line, and it said, make it twice as big. So I understood at that particular time something was happening in the United States with textiles and they were getting very bigger where mine, I was relating to the human body and got very small. So this is the piece I did for Jack show. And I, we sent it to New York with one of our summer girls and she delivered it to the museum and that's when Jack presented his wonderful book, The Dyer's Art. That we're, this is moving ahead, 2000. This woman, that's not a bunch of garlic she's holding there. It's, it's uh, silk cocoons. And she was walking through the market of uh, Tlaquiaco in 2001. I approached her and said, do you have any silk to, to sell? She says, I don't have it here. I have it in my home. I'll come to your home tomorrow. This is uh, the woman from Penasco about a four hour drive from the city of Oaxaca. And uh, she's in the patio at 
Casa Panchita, and she sold me white silk, pink silk, dyed, and this one's in a plastic bag because I can't take it out because it's silk which has been dyed but not rinsed. And I, I haven't seen a lot of exploration with this and I'll show you what I did with it. This is the piece, it's wedge weave, and all the dark areas you see there are of course where it's the very heavily saturated dye. Clamped it up, put it in a bath of warm hot water actually with, uh, with uh, vinegar, and then this is the piece when it comes out, it just spreads all over the place. I used an awful lot of waxed linen to prevent it from uh, going all over the place. And this is the final piece when I finally finished it, I called it Schlackiako. And this is a close-up of it. The, the yellow you see there is wax linen which resisted the, 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 the dye it's working. Here's, here's an example of pieces of China silk I put in between the two. So it's really very potent. Another piece, I, you see it's been tri-ticked up. Uh, four pieces that I dyed in indigo, put them out, 90 degrees, and then I began to weave pieces. Again, theirs are very, very, very dark. Oh, and Kuyuchi is in this too, and the Kuyuchi tends to sort of resist it. And there, here are the pieces, and then it was sewn. I had um, Guadalupe there to help me. And there's the piece, it's called Improvisation. So all these pieces sort of sewn onto the surface. It's not unlike the pieces up at Casa. There's a close-up of it. I'm actually doing four salvage weaving on the surface of the piece until I like it. Um, in 2012, Jack Larson invited me to be in a show at the Texel Museum. And this is a yantra, a yantra from Burma. It's an undershirt that I guess only men wear, maybe women. You take it to a conundero or a faith healer and you tell your wishes and desires and they draw onto the surface what it is they, they what you want out of life. And you, you don't wear, the, you don't advertise this because some of your desires are very explicit. <laughs> very explicit, let me tell you. And, um, and so this is a yantra and my yantra, oh and here are my little runners. So on the top row is where I actually brocaded with the yarn and then I folded it so my little runners below are, you get to be an upside down runner at times because of the, that, but all of that is this, and this is this little piece here you can look at. It's an amazing process. Anyway, this is my yantra. It has 26.2 miles. It says, go man, go girl, run, win, ran, won. And uh, I used to be a marathon runner, and I was always sorry in high school I never got a Letterman sweater. So at age, age, at age 80, I finally got one. So that's that one. And that's a close-up of that. Again, that's wax linen, which tends to sort of resist the dye. Um, Yoshiko Wada came into my life. Well, she's come into my life back and forth for many times. She phoned me in 1990, late 90s, to say, Jim, I want you to weave eight panels. Uh, I want you to reproduce a pre-Columbian textile from uh, Peru. I'm going to send you the cloth in the mail. I said, Yoshiko, why do I want to do this? And she says, because I'm sending you to Chile. I said, okay. <laughs> and so I learned actually how to do four salvage weaving and it's all because of her. Uh, this is my little simple loom. I did eight of those. And then I had to ship them back to the Bay Area to have them dyed. I was not responsible for dyeing. But because of Yoshiko, I did this one. 
This is called 282 Kisses, 282 Besos. Um, it's natural dyed, and it's based on Oscar Wilde's tomb in Père Lachaise in Paris, where women and men will put on heavy lipstick and kiss the tomb. Uh, the government has put up a barrier, but ath very athletic women are still able to get in there and kiss the tomb. This is called um, Spotty. It's uh, all synthetic linen, but indigo. And probably one of my favorite pieces, and I don't have too many, and, uh, it's called Nido. And this is really sort of based, uh, the central portion is based on the wonderful tradition from the state of Ildago and in the town of, and Alejandro will correct me, Ixmiquilpan. They do absolutely beautiful uh, agave weavings, four selvage agave weavings. They are so beautiful, ayates. And that's what I started on here. And then I saw a catalog from the Denver, um, a Denver show of a piece that's from the Metropolitan that had the four uh, corners w with um, shibori, and so that's what it ended up being. And I think this piece works pretty well. Uh, lastly, uh, I taught the students when I taught at Long Beach State. I didn't want them to go into the yarn room until they knew what a yarn was, and I made them take a brown paper bag. It was actually a Trader Joe brown paper bag. And I showed them how to take it all apart and soften it. And they had to spin a ball of yarn out of brown paper bag before they went into the yarn room. Once they learned how to do that, they went in the yarn room with an eye as what a yarn is. And they would show me, this is two, this is three, this is one. Uh, but nobody was interested in weaving with it. I did. I wove the side of a Trader Joe bag, and then I took a print from it. And then realizing that nobody really knew what a four salvage cloth was, I took a portion of the print, blew it up, and made this one, which is a four salvage cloth. So people ask, well, what's that? I say, it's a weaving. <laughs> and that's it. Lastly, unfortunately, Verily and I originally had planned to um, drive down, but when our middle daughter told me that she would take the keys away from me and also the car if I <laughs> attempted to drive 3,000 miles, um, we couldn't do it. We wanted to drive down so that Verily could bring her cochinilla bugs to grace the walls of the uh, textile museum uh, so now they grace the patio of our home in, Waha in Palm Springs, and uh, she's working on many, many more. And I want to thank you so much for listening.